Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the greatest rock and roll stories in the universe. All from the fans' perspective, it's Rock Stories with the Brunster. Now, here's the host of the show, my rockin' daddy, the Brumster. Hey, welcome, Rock Stories with the Brumster. That's Brumster with two M's. You see one M, get out of Dodge. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Rock Stories with the Brumster podcast, 11 a.m. Sundays at Rock Radio 559. Go get the app. Seriously, great rock and roll all the time. Brian K. Martinez, my radio friend, um, started the station, runs it, does a great job. Uh, Go get the app at the Google Play Store or your Apple App Store. Just type in Rock Radio 559 and get the best rock and roll. Over 4,500 songs in rotation, A-sides, B-sides, you name it. Rock Radio 559. And, of course, all things Brumster and Brumster On Demand for Rock Stories with the Brumster Past Episodes. Uh, at the Brumster Spotify channel, check that out, okay? The whole entire premise of this program is to tell rock stories, your favorite memories, your favorite concert and artist memories, all from the fans' perspective. And when I dreamt up this program and started it, there's one guy from my life, one of my best buddies, one of my best, like, family, this guy, like family, um, Greg Hatley, and he's known as The Hat. And all the way back in the day, in my early classic rock days, he would call the radio station and do stuff on the air with me. And a uh, real mentor in the classic rock realm, and a lot of the knowledge I have was soaked up sitting around listening to this dude talk with my stepdad and friends about some of the coolest concert memories they've had. It's exactly the person I was thinking of when I thought of this time machine basically because that's what it is is thinking about concert and artist memories all from the fans perspective and you're who i thought of hat uh greg hatley aka the hat welcome to rock stories with the brumster brother what's happening big j we are here on the air man remember just like back in the day right oh my here we go. <laughs> we used to do that all the time. He would call up the radio station when I was working at the classic rock station and put in the requests and that was just the coolest um, dude to to be able to hang around. And you get to hang around with him tonight uh, here on Rock Stories with the Brumster, the hat. Uh, hat, you're exactly who I thought of when I thought of this show. From the fan's perspective, you've got a collection of of tickets uh, from different concerts that you've seen throughout the years. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, you, you mentioned uh, back in the day when you were starting out doing your rock shows and stuff, you actually used your dad's name as Neil. That's right. That's Neil right. Brown was your call name. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's a shout-out to your pops right there. The real Neil. There you go. Yeah. And uh, I just thought everybody needed to know that. So. But uh, as far as ticket subs, uh, I've, I've, I've got quite a few here. Uh, my first was BTO in 1976 which was April 8th and the opening act for BTO at that time was Wishbone at. Oh, where was that at, man? That was, that was my very first concert. I was 16 years old and I did not know what to expect. That was uh, when BTO hit the scene. You know, Randy Bachman, after he left the band, the Guess Who, and a band prior to that, uh, he formed BTO, and they they got pretty famous when that song, Taking Care of Business, came out. And in 76, that was a pretty hot ticket. And 
And Wishbone Ash totally blew me away to begin with. Uh, and that was a pretty fabulous show. Did you anticipate uh, what Wishbone Ash was going to play, or did you already know their music from, no, from having I, I, heard I, it? I, I vaguely heard of them, but I, you know, I, I, I did not know what to expect until they started playing, and they just they rock. They're a very excellent band. And I think to this day, they still have an ensemble of somebody that's left that they can still perform some of their music or something. I, I'm not, you have to check me on that. Wishbone Ash on tour. <laughs> Find your tickets at wishboneash.com. <laughs> there you go. You know, or, uh, however, however you want to follow it. But, uh, but, uh, you know, as far as, uh, I, you know, like I was saying to everybody, I have a little photo album of my studs here, and I've had to go back in my mind over the years to, you know, write a little something as a memory of, of concerts that I've gone to. And I, my biggest memory of that night in a, in a positive way was just the fact that it was my first concert and it was a, it was a great thing to see, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, you know, when, when BTO took the stage, all the people standing up front, uh, at Selling Arena in Fresno, uh, they pulled out this giant Canadian flag and were, were, were flying it in front of the stage. And that was, of course, because Randy Bachman was from Canada. And, and that kind of hit me, you know, in a, in a, in a great way, uh, you know, and, and, of course, Back in those days, uh, at Selling Arena, and most arenas, anywhere you went to see a concert, uh, there were not chairs on the floor. It was an arena of stadium seats around, but the whole floor was wide open, and nobody sat in chairs. It was a free-for-all uh first come, first serve to get to the state. And that particular night, we were sitting in the stands. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't, you know, I was a 16-year-old kid. So. And, but uh, there was uh, a lot of memories to go with that one, uh, you know, and some negative, you know. Uh, it, 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 it was, it was, uh, one of the, one of the things that I, that, that I'll never forget that that night in a negative way, uh, was, there was what I would call, there, I would say they were kind of like, a cowboy type people. And maybe I shouldn't say this, but, you know, uh, there was a African-American walking by and they surrounded him and they wanted to, to attack him on the floor. And that guy turned around and held his own and started kicking butt on all those cowboy guys until the FCC guys, which I call the Fresno Convention Center guys, they were the uh, uh, security. And they came and rescued him. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to go on the floor in the first place because I didn't know what to expect. 
Right, but that's that's a pretty uh, sad thing to have to witness, especially at 16, especially what's going on in the country at the time when you were 16, right, Hat? Exactly, you know, and that, that was a tough situation for me to watch, you know. And, and but, you know, and lo and behold, it, it all worked out. So, you know, I, I've seen a lot of that stuff in several concerts. Not necessarily uh, possibly a racial motivated situation, but just random, you know, stuff. But, you know, and, you know, of course, we all know later on in history, uh, the Who concert in Cincinnati, you know, when people rushed the door and the tragedy that happened there. Uh, started making people sit in chairs on the floor. They they ended that stuff in in the indoor arena. Right. But but back in those days, you know, I'm talking seventy six, seventy seven. I mean, my next concert was Robin Trower, then Peter Frampton, and you know. I mean, back to back to back to back, Aerosmith, Black Sabbath, Ted Nugent, we was cool. The list goes on and on, you know what I mean? And, and the 70s was just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It was just an explosion of American rock, British rock, everything. It's, it's, it, it was just, Every week, every you know, every month, there was a new band coming to town. It was just great, yeah. right? Right, and and these bands were people forget because now they look back on them as classic rock bands, whom some still touring. Even the Rolling Stones to this day still out there touring. It's amazing. Uh, but they look back through the rear view mirror at, at them uh, as we're traveling in, in our time machine and talking about rock memories with Hat on Rock Stories with the Brumster here on Spotify and Rock Radio 559. But looking back, you know, is is generally, ha- but but we don't think of it as like, like how it was at the time, which is, wow, th- this is brand new, like hot music, fresh off the presses, right? This is brand new stuff. Almost like right now you get a brand new release from Lady Gaga or something like it's it's a huge thing when it happened, you know, to go see Robin Trower and and Peter Frampton live back to back like that. Wow, man, that was pretty awesome stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, and some of those bands, I I. I, I was just hearing, uh, you know, hearsay about or, or somebody older than me telling me, hey, you got to check this guy Robin Trower out. Well, he was the headline, you know, I mean, and, and a band called uh, Savoy Brown was one of the openers for them, for him. And another great band, you know, and uh, I, you know, I mean, I was just learning about newer bands and and stuff. Of course, when I bought the Frampton tickets, I, I bought two for me and a friend of mine, and and I, I there used to be a place called the Inner Ear in Visay on Main Street is uh, where I went to buy my tickets all the time. And, or I would go to Gottschalk on, uh, at the mall on Mooney Boulevard in Visalia. And I went to buy a, a $6 ticket for Peter Frampton uh, and um, at the inner ear, and the guy that owned it told me, "No, it's ten bucks." 
<laughs> and I says, it's a $6 ticket. He says, no, it's Peter Frampton. It's 10 bucks. <laughs> and he goes, I got two left. You want them? And I said, well, I'll go to Cock Chop. So totally just, haggling you, man. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I so I, so I drove to Cock Chop on Mooney Boulevard across town. And I went, I went into their ticket office for the cell in the arena in Fresno. And they said, sold out. Sorry. So I... I, I hauled buns back over to uh, the inner ear on Main Street and said, okay, Scott Chalk says they're sold out. You want 10 bucks for those tickets? The rip off, but I'll take them. And he says, there you go. So I had to pay 20 bucks for, for uh, $12 worth of tickets. You know, the extra four bucks a piece. And that was because Frampton came out with that live album, and everybody was selling out before he could, you know. You know, that was one of them concerts that you, it was like gold to get a ticket. Oh, everyone and, wanted to be there, huh? Yeah. And a band called Gentle Giant opened for him, which I had never heard of before. And Gentle Giant was more of a, a what do you say, a, kind of a, a progressive rock, kind of like Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer in a way. Right. And and uh, they sounded great to me. I mean, if, you know, in, in for their style, you know. But the Frampton show was just, it was, it was pretty awesome. I, 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 I got to see Frampton a couple more times in the future, you know, and stuff. And, uh, and I, I think that first time I saw him was probably the best, but, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it was one of them things. It was, Still, what? Not one of those nights that I went up front, you know, on the floor. I still was in the stand. I think. I think the first time I went up on to the front was to see a brand new band open for Black Sabbath. The first time I saw Black Sabbath, and. That was uh, the that was actually two days after my birthday in 1976 in November 9th. I, my birthday was the seventh. That was a November 9th concert, and the band that that nobody had ever heard of that were blowing the world away at the time was called Boston. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah, man. And and it was two days after my birthday, man. And, and in 1976, and I, that was the first time I went up front. And we got there early, and we were up right, right up by the stage, in front of the stage. And, you know, they had fences up and stuff and all that, but <laughs> but I, I I was totally blown away by Tom Scholz and his his uh, guitar theatrics and what he could make songs come out of that thing without even touching his guitar, you know, and. It was it was amazing, and then Sabbath came out and blew me away. You know, what I mean, but I think I think Boston pretty much stole the show. Man, and and Fresno, all the, all these great acts coming to Fresno. Um, yeah. Wow, Rock Radio five five nine. We are in the five five nine. Check us out. Get the app on your Google Play 
store, get the app Rock Radio 559 um, hat. Hold on just a moment, if you don't mind. Sure. Fresno, like seeing Boston, I mean, I could just imagine Boston being the opening band, but wow, that first album, Boston, Boston, was like a greatest hits album right there, right? Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, it, it uh, wow. It, 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 I, I was shocked to hear the album and then to see what Tom Scholes was doing with his guitar. The, the song, uh, 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 I can't think of the name of it now. Uh, uh, long time for play, or, or it was the last song on one side of the album. Right. Yeah. And, for, for play, long time. Yes. Yes. And uh, he was he was standing there in front of everybody on stage. And the sound of his guitar was making all these noises like he was a, a wizard with his hands going, moving up and down and uh, away from and towards the guitar without ever touching the guitar. It was like, it was like, it was like the electricity going through his fingers or something. It was it was hard to explain. Wow! And I was standing I, I was standing up front to to witness that, and it, it was crazy. And then, but, uh, then, then this is all fresh, brand new stuff at that time. This is all fresh, brand new. These aren't hits that you've heard on the radio. They're coming out for the first time, opening up for what? Who 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 did you say? Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath. Yeah. That was the first time I saw Black Sabbath. And the second time I saw Black Sabbath, let's see, I pulled that one up. That was September 22nd at the same place, Selling Arena, in 1978, two years later. And another brand new band opened up, right? And... I was up front for that one, too. Who's the brand new band opening for Sabbath in 78 at the cell end? Uh-huh. And guess who that was? Who? Playing their first album. It was none other than a band called Van Halen. Oh, man. Wow. 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 Yeah. And... Uh, what, what, one of my memories was of that, one of my main memories was, uh, Tony Iommi, the guitarist of Sabbath, the lefty, they were on tour with, with Van Halen, right? And, and or vice versa. And, and, Tony Iommi came out warming up during intermission and right before they came out full blown you know, to do the show. And he came out warming up uh, one of Van, Eddie Van Halen's riffs, you know. You know, that kind of thing, right? And that's when Ozzy came out on stage and yelled. I was up front. I heard it all. And, and Ozzy came out and yelled at Tony. He says, you want to freaking play that shit? And you join their band and get the fuck out of here. You know? Are you serious? Whoa. Yeah. And Ozzy told Tony Omi that. Tony Omi just laughed. And he started warming up his own stuff. Yeah. And it wasn't a month later, a couple of months later, Ozzy left the band. And that that's when all that happened, man. I right. Mean, all that drama. I, 
all that drama is really, spilling over. Yeah. Like even you in the as a fan, you're there watching the show, and the drama is spilling over to where you're able to hear it. Yeah, it was it was crazy, man. And Ozzy left the band a couple months later, apparently, and, and that's when uh, when Ronnie James Dio left. Uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow and decided to go with, with Black Sabbath and replace <laughs> Ozzy and Ozzy went on his own and then Dio went on his own there's all kinds of crap going on with all that man. <laughs> there was all kinds of re- repercussions you know but, uh, yeah and, and weird stories man I mean I witnessed that night Ozzy yelling at Tony, man, like, you want to play that crap? Get out of here, dude. Go join, go join their band, he said. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a kick-ass concert. I mean, both times I've seen Sabbath, I got to see Boston as a brand new group and Van Halen as a brand new, brand new group. And both, Brand new group pretty much outdid the headline. So Black Sabbath never failed to bring you a new opener and introduce you to a new act that was going to basically be Hall of Fame t- style, you know, rock and roll, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess that was the promoter's job back in the day, you know, to put somebody with quality that was going to be able to hang with a, with a group with a status like Black Sabbath, you know? I mean, they, they, you know, they were kind of hard to beat in those days, you know? And, and to put somebody as an opener, uh, you know, they, they better be on the same level. Or, and, but you also don't want, the opener to outshine you. And then everyone's tired. The kiss kiss opened up for Aerosmith at the save Mart center. And it was the worst decision ever. Not that Aerosmith's not worthy of the, you know, of, of the headliner for that. I, I, um, they are worthy, but the reality is, is there's fire and flames and everything sucking all of our senses dry during kiss with the whole show and everything, not just the music. So then all of a sudden Aerosmith comes out and everyone sat down. And I looked around and I'm like, whoa, we're all sitting down for Aerosmith. That can't be right. Aerosmith totally should have opened for Kiss if they knew what they were doing, you know? Well, you know, you mentioned Aerosmith, I mean, and Kiss. And, you know, I did see Kiss. Uh, I I wasn't myself, I can't exactly tell you. It was around the same time, but uh, uh, a band that that was up and coming that opened for them at Salon Arena was called Cheap Trick, and I I I got off on Cheap Trick time, you know, and and then but I went to see Kiss. And well, Rush, mm-hmm. Rush was opening up for Kiss, I think, for a while there too. Did you ever see Rush with Kiss, or, or have a chance to see Geddy Lee and Neil Peart? And- I, I I did. I I saw Rush twice. Once at Cell Arena and once at uh, Warner Theater. And Sammy Hagar opened for Rush at, at Warner Theater. That was a blazing show right there, man. I was that was just totally awesome. I'm not sure if you ever went to a, a Warner Theater concert. That would be like the Fox Theater, only larger. It's a little more regal. It's a little bit more fancy. Oh man, it, it was it was it was a it was a great place to see a concert, and and. Uh, still is for that matter but uh yeah uh rush rush is one of those 
progressive type and, and probably the greatest drummer in the world ever played for Rush, you know, Neil Peart. I mean, that guy, you didn't ever see him. All you saw is his arms and his hands and his sticks. <laughs> and and cymbals flying and, and he had this, his, this majestical looking drum set all around him, you know, and a gong behind him. And he, he was just amazing to watch. He, he put on his own show. And, and, he, and he wrote a lot of the lyrics too. Neil did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was, you know, uh, you know I, I, I used to think John Bonham was, was probably the best. I, I think Neil Peart was probably up there with, you know, with the best. I, you mentioned Sammy. Uh, you love Sammy. I know that. Uh, see, oh, yeah. With Montrose and with Van Halen and by himself, huh? Well, yeah. In fact, I've seen Sammy a few times. But I've never seen him with Montrose. But I have seen Montrose. <laughs> I, you know, after Sammy left, I saw Sammy open for Robin Trower once, and then I saw Montrose without Sammy, and I never saw Sammy with Van Halen, and so I, I've always, I, I did see Sammy in Visalia with, uh, with uh, uh, the La Boritas. When he came out with the Marching to Mars album. Oh, that when was so went, awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, were you there? Yeah, man, yeah. And oh, I, uh, I, do I remember you being there? <laughs> oh, dude, he, he literally comes out and during his shows. He comes out with the with the margaritas rocking and the guy you, you wouldn't think, but he, he looks like he's still in his forties, you know, he's in such great shape and he's, he's, he's like the Dick Clark of rock and roll. He never ages. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, it was, that was a fun night, man. <laughs> uh, that, that, it just, it, it was, it was crazy. I mean, it was packed, sold out. They, they all the beer sold out, and so all they had left was tequila and whiskey, and everybody left hammered. <laughs> One time, I went and saw the Red Rocker open up for Aerosmith at Oracle Arena in Oakland, um, and uh, stood up, and there was a lady behind think, me yeah, during. I, think I remember you telling me about that. Yes, this, yeah. this lady threw a lime at my head from her drink, like because I stood up and I was tall. Just I didn't realize I was in front of her, and I'm just rocking out, and all of a sudden I get hit in the head, like, ow! And my wife's just <laughs> like, "That lady just threw a lime at you." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> I turn around and she's all, "Sit down." <laughs> Whoa. That, that, that's because you're a tall guy, man. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I paid for these seats. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, I just, you know, not to get off any uh, classic subject here. I, I did uh, attend a concert uh, last September uh, in uh, Paso Robles basically Templeton, Pastor Robles area. A uh, buddy of mine, uh, Dennis, he, uh, he, he had some, he had an extra ticket to, so, to go see an upcoming chick. It's been out for a while now. Her name is Samantha Fish. And uh, it was at a uh, Barrel House Brewing Company over there in Templeton, Tascadero, right outdoors, and 
and uh, loose rock, and and she just kicked ass, man. Younger chick, and and it's, she's upcoming. She's got her own little label now, record label, and all kinds of shit going on. But anyway, mentioned being tall, right? So yeah. we're sitting there, and, and 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 we're sitting there, and we're up front, kind of like it, there's enough room for people to stand there and dance if they want, right? Well, everybody comes down there and stands to watch the concert. Said we're sitting there, right? Well, it's okay. We could still see. They're high enough on the stage where we could still see them, right? But here comes these two tall guys, right? And I mean, I swear, both of them are seven foot, right? And where do they stand? Right in front of me and Dennis, right? <laughs> And we were thinking the same thing. Sit down, motherfuckers. <laughs> Excuse my language. But <laughs> it is. Oh. And they wouldn't move all night, man. It was like crap, dude. You could see around these guys. I call them the trees, man. <laughs> the it's, trees it's, showed up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they were, if, if they weren't standing there, we would have still been able to see the, the show, you know. But, I mean, those two guys just block our view most of the night. Oh, they, would not, speak, they would not move. Speaking of blocking our view, we were talking a little bit earlier. I, I went to ZZ Top at the Fox Theater in Visalia, and I got a front row seat thinking, oh, my God, front row, this is going to be great. And it was like <laughs> blocked my view the whole way behind this speaker. It was crazy. And you mentioned you went to a show and the same thing happened. Tell tell the folks. Well, with the speakers being blocked, yeah, uh, that was a, in a Blackheart concert. And just like you, I, I thought I was getting a, a pretty cherry seat and you know it was a second row seat available and I thought I was getting a great seat well once I got down there and the show started I found out that I was being blocked by the speakers on the right side of the stage and I could not see the whole band. I could see Joan Jett because she was on, from my view, she was on the left-hand part of the stage. And I could see a bass player occasionally come up and back and as a keyboard player. Never got to see the drummer, the big lead guitarist that played for her was behind the speaker, but he would jam. He would come up front to the front of the stage, and I could see him off and on. But for the most part, I could not ever see the whole band all at once. And I was pretty disappointed, and the security would not let anybody up front to the stage. And things like that. Well, so I was trying to be patient, you know, and I was like, well, whatever, you know, and having a good time as I could, and talking to the security guy the whole time that was standing there in the corner, and, and uh, it was toward the end of the concert, which I knew, you know, by time-wise, I, I could tell it was just about over a couple more songs. And, and uh, I decided to, you know, I, I, I'm i done with this, you know. I, I've had enough. I, I've been to all these concerts in my life, like I just described to you, being up playing at Black Sabbath and all that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, when I was a teenager 
And here I am. You know, this was back uh, in uh, 2015, I think. And I, I said, I'm done with this. <laughs> I'm going to stand up front. You know, because I know it's about over anyway. If they throw me out, they throw me out. So I told the, the security guard, I can't stand this no more. So I grabbed my beer and I went up front. And I'm standing there and rocking with beer in one hand and throwing a peace sign, rocking on the other hand. And Joan Jett looked over and started smiling at me and... The guitarist came running up and jamming in front of me. And about that time, security started to come towards me. And and a DJ, a local DJ, April Sky, she decided uh, she wanted to tell me, Greg, you better sit down. They're going to throw you out. I said, I and I just. And about that time, I went ahead and turned around and and started to head back. But when I did, I looked up with my beer in one hand and my, my lock and keep sign in the other hand towards the crowd. And everybody gave me a hoot and a holler and screamed for me. And, and another chick gave me a high five. And, and I went back to my seat behind the speakers, you but, know. And, but you did it, man. You totally it, did it. You're just like, yeah, screw yeah. this noise, man. I'm doing it. Yeah, well, and I didn't I didn't blow it. I didn't try to get on stage or nothing. You know, and they weren't letting people. There was people there, dude, that had kids with them. There, there was actually rockers there, families, you know, women and, you know, families, mother and fathers, and and they took their kids with them, right? And, and they were up front, and and these kids were not allowed to go up front and, and jam, you know? You're, you're talking 10, 11, 12-year-old kids, man, and they weren't, they weren't allowed to have the real experience, you know? Because security was not allowed. But, you know, that's another story. Security. But, You've probably seen security either maybe get a little tight or be a little too loose at some concerts in, in, in the history uh, books, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, like the one I mentioned at the beginning, you know, with the the African guy and the cowboy, you know, I mean, that's not good. I saw another one of the Blue Oyster, I think it was a Blue Oyster Colt, Colt concert. It was intermission, and, you know, you sit there and you're just watching people walking around on the floor, you know, because there's no seat. This one guy was walking towards I don't know, the, the exit. And another guy was walking towards the front of the stage and they crossed paths. Well, they both kept walking for a second, but the one that was walking towards the stage, after a couple of steps, turned around and walked, ran, almost ran back up to the other guy, tapped him on the shoulder, and the guy turned around and cold cocked him. Knocked him on his ass on the ground. He was out cold. They had to carry him off. And for no reason. I mean, unless maybe they knew each other or something, man. I don't know. It, it, just, it was stupid. And, you know, you, you saw some weird things happen, man. Sad to say it. Nothing different today, you know? Right, right. But, you know, when they when they made it to where everybody had to have seats and stuff on the floor and, you know, it's just like it's Mid-State Fair and Pasco. It's the same thing. You, you, 
you got to take a seat. It's not, you know, it's not free for all and go up front unless you're lucky enough to, to get up there. And you mentioned the Mid-State Fair. Um, folks, um, without a doubt, we cannot underestimate fair acts. We can't just say, oh, they're at the fair. It's no. There's some big names playing at some of these fairs, huh? Well, yeah, I've seen quite a few. You mentioned Aerosmith earlier. That's the last time I saw them. In fact, my ex-wife and my brother and sister-in-law, I got split up from. And it was it was Aerosmith's first American show off of their European tour. They only had like a handful of American shows they were going to play, right? When they came off of a European tour. Yeah. And that was their first one, Miss State Fair. People came from L.A., they came from Frisco, they came from everywhere. It, that, that place is supposed to be 18,000 capacity. There was over 20,000 people there. And it was just, uh, it was crazy. As soon as the show started, my old lady and her brother and sister-in-law took off and I got caught up in the mix and I tried to get up to them and before I could get to them, security cut us all off, but they got through. So they got through up front to stand there up front on that, right? So they security told me they looked at my ticket stuff said, "Now you're back over here, bucko." <laughs> you know, you're <laughs> sorry, you sorry, bucko. <laughs> I said, "That's my old lady right over there. Look at her waving at me. I don't freaking care. You're getting back to your seat." I said, "All right, good." So I went back to. I didn't even go back to my seat that night. I went over where the I was close to the bathrooms, I was close to the beer bar, and I just stood there by myself all night. <laughs> just rocked out. Yeah, and just like old days, I was alone anyway, man. So I, I just watched people and had my beer, and, and if I needed to take a leak, I was right next to the outhouses. And, but that was the... Uh, you know, that was a crazy night, man. I mean, 20,000 people at Mid-State Fair, that was pretty crowded. You know, something mm -hmm. that I always see is you've got a different concert shirt or a different band shirt that you buy at, at the concert. You do, I always, huh? have, I always have to buy a concert shirt, man. I, I was not lucky enough the last, the, the, the last, Fair concert I went to was 19 at Tulare Fair with 38 Special. I tried to buy a concert shirt after the concert was over, and the guy was packing them all up, and he wouldn't sell me one. I I even offered him extra money, and he still wouldn't sell me one. He told me he had to pack them up and get on the bus. And not pissed, but so I, I missed out on the thirty-eight special uh, T-shirts. But, but uh, was it a good band? Yeah. With, uh, well, I mean, was good. Uh, was thirty-eight special still rocking a great concert? Oh man, they kicked ass, dude! It was a band I always wanted to see, man, and they and they rocked it, dude. That was twenty nineteen. Uh, you, your mom and stepdad went. And, uh, uh, Rick and Glenda and Matt and Jennifer and Woody and his wife. Yeah, you know, there was a bunch of us that went. It was fun, man. Not sure why you guys didn't go, but uh, oh, I missed it. I missed it. I wish I could have <laughs> gone. Hold on loosely. Oh man, that was the last song. Yeah. 
That was their final song. Anyone, yeah. that, anyone that you haven't seen that is in your on your bucket list that you still want to see? Um. Uh, well, I, there's, there's, they'll never be playing again, probably. But uh, you know, I never really wanted to see the Stones, and they're still around. And I, I just, I, I don't know. I just. To me, it's just a little, it's not my world, I guess. Right. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, Hendrix would have been a nice one to go see. But, uh, uh, you know, for anybody that's around still, like, like Skinner just played in Fresno. And... Uh, I had no ambitions to go. You know, they just did Chick Chancey, Flores, or something. And they got one guy that's left. And, you know, I, I, I saw a blog hat at Tulare Fair uh, in 2015 also. It was, in fact, it was the night before I saw uh, Joan Jett. And I did a meet and greet with them, and I got a I got a T-shirt, and it, I had them sign it and stuff. And the only original guy in the band was the drummer. He looked like he looked like he was my grandpa. That's what happened when mm-hmm. I saw Humble Pie. Um, it was just one original member. Exactly. It was like this yeah. is this is basically a. Uh, uh, a cover band, right? I mean, I, I know, I know you saw Foreigner without Lou Graham. Um, uh, is it? Is it still? It's still a good show, though, right? Foreigner. No, it was Fog Hat. Oh no! But I mean, in addition, Foreigner is singing without their lead singer. They have a new lead singer instead of Lou Graham as well. I mean, just these bands that they were they they come out and they only have just one original member. It's hard to sit there and say I saw that band, right? It's hard to check that off the list. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, but, you know, one of the comments I made to the guy that sang uh, for Flog Hat that night when I did the meet and greet with all of them, uh, and one of the comments I made to the guy, he was a younger guy, I told him, I says, man, I says, I got to give you props, dude. I said, you sounded just like Lonesome Dave. And I mean, the guy had the voice, man. you know, for Fog Hat. And I, I did have to give him that. Um, right. And I, I did a meet and greet with Les Dudek one time at the Orange Blossom Junction in Exeter. And Les Dudek used to play with the Allman Brothers, and he also did, you know, he played with other bands, too. Like, he, he played with Stevie Nicks, too, on the run. And Les Dudek, you know, I did a meet and greet with him. He signed my album. I took my album with me, and and, and the, the other two guys or three guys that he had with him, uh, the band, I said, you guys sign it too. And he goes, no, we're not. No, no, we're not. No, you know, I said, you played with him tonight, didn't you? He said, yeah. I said, sign it. You know? You know, they were nobody. You know, they were a backup band of his, you know? That's right. That's right. And I said, sign it anyway, man. You know, you might be somebody someday, dude. And so, you know, when I talked to the, when I talked to the drummer of Fog Hat, you know, he was the original member and I, and I, 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 I he says, I said, you're going to keep doing this or what? And he goes, yeah, I'm out. I'm going to stop till I can't, you know? 
I'm going to keep on keeping on, man, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's kind of how things are going now, you know. I mean, different bands, you know, they're, 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 they keep members. I don't know. Well, it's also it's, the way they eat. It's the way they pay their bills. And just to stop doing it because one of them dies off doesn't seem fair. So it's, you know, Kiss is continuing on without their originals. Lots of bands are continuing on without their originals. Eddie Van Halen continued on without his original and did great, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, but, you know, nowadays, here it is, 2022, you know, a lot of these rockers that I saw as a teenager, these guys are in their 70s now. And things are different now, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it, it's kind of like even Sammy Hagar. That, that guy's got so much energy, but, I mean, he's, he's, he's got to be slowing down, running all back and forth up and down the stage, you know? Yeah, you cannot I mean, just jump around like that. Like, you can't just jump up and down like they once did. Those knees, they're yeah. not going to take all that. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like trying to watch uh, Madonna or J Lo or you know these you know these people that that all they did was dance and jump around and do all this crap all their life. Yeah, okay, they they can sing, but they can't do that stuff no more. So then their whole show, their whole act is gone. You know, and that that's that's their problem. Right. You know, I mean, the substance. They're, phys- they're 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 physically not able to do the performing anymore. You know, so the so the singers like Celine Dion or somebody else that just stands there all night. Well, they gotta worry about is their voice. You know what I mean? Right. Right. They don't have to worry about the physical thing you know if you if you base it all on the music right if you instead of basing it on you know being scantily dressed or you know uh half naked up there or whatever it is you're you're doing your dance routine have it actually be based on the actual music and what you're listening what's going inside of the ear instead and if that's the case heck stephen hawking could have rolled out in his wheelchair and done an album, you know what I mean? If he, if he could have sung and, and had that ability, but you know, you don't have to be dancing around. We, that's why the theater of the mind of radio really is where a lot of this music took hold before people went and saw the concerts. They heard it on the radio, right? Hat. Right. Exactly. You know, you have Wolfman Jack, you know, yeah, he had all, uh, you know, Dick Clark. You had guys that uh, that that that, that there there uh, there's an old song. I can't remember who sang it. It was it says it, it, I don't know. It says I am the morning DJ on W O L D or something. You know, and it was a song. And it, 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 DJs were everything back then. I mean, you know, they used to uh, wine and dine DJs. So they would play their music on the radio in order to get famous. See, if the DJ didn't like you, then he wouldn't play your music. Right. Like like working man, uh, Rush was having a hell of a time breaking through and suddenly the DJ in Cleveland flips over to the B side, which is working man on that album for Rush. Yeah. And and Working Man ends up taking them and putting them on the charts and making them famous. But the DJ made that decision that made that breakthrough happen. It was the radio that did it, right? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, it's just, it, yeah, and that that is a breakthrough song. I mean, you know, I mean, and again, Rush is one of them bands that you have to have a, a, a liking to, you know. But if you really listen to the words and and their style of the music, it all comes together. But you, you have to appreciate that style. And that one song did break them through. And that's what it takes to be able to break through. You need that one song, that one hit that says, okay, yes, there's one hit wonders out there, but everybody has to have that one song that breaks them through. Huh, Hat? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are a lot of one hit wonders, <laughs> but, uh, and some of their hits were top hits, but they just, couldn't do much after that, you know. I mean, a couple of examples. I mean, I, okay, Radar Love with Golden Earring. I mean, they, you know, that was a great hit, and it's still a great hit. And, but did it take them over the top? No, you know. And then there's, uh, like, the Nat, my Sharona or something, you know? I mean, okay, what else did they do? You know, uh, then there's, uh, Sweet was one that, that actually pulled off a, a two or three, you know? Yeah, Ballroom Blitz, um, uh, Love is Like Oxygen, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Golden Earring also had Twilight Zone, but they were a two-head wonder, right? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, they they they, they weren't, it never really took them over the top, you know? I mean, they, they never were Boston. They never were, you know, even Aerosmith, for the most part, they had a couple of great songs, but, I don't think they were as great as people think they are. You no, know? no. Aerosmith got sober, and once they got sober, they they broke out with permanent vacation once they got sober and became the stars we know today. Huh? Yeah, well, I did see him in the cell and arena the second time I saw him, and... I I was ready to leave after they came on stage. Really? Yeah. In fact, that was the night that uh, ACDC was the opening act for them, right? And nobody had seen ACDC before. And people were booing ACDC and throwing stuff at them with Bon Scott. I mean, they were throwing shit at him on stage. And I, I've talked to people that have actually seen that concert <laughs> that were there like I was. Yeah. And, and I was freaking out, man. And, and uh, Juan Scott turned around and and they stopped right in the middle of a song, right? And Bon Scott standing there in his shorts and shit, he he says he said, Fuck you, Fresno. He says We already got paid to do this fresh gig and we're gonna cut, finish our fucking show whether you fucking like it or not. And he turned around and pulled his shorts down and said Kiss my ass <laughs> and told told Fresno to kiss his ass. After they were already throwing shit at him. Man. <laughs> and, and, and then they started playing again, right? 
<laughs> and then people started getting into it, right? And and then when they played a whole lot of Rosie, Bon Scott put uh what's the guitarist name? Uh A C D Angus Young. Angus. Yeah, put Angus on Bon Scott, put him on his shoulders. And he had a freaking antenna on his guitar playing the solo of Whole Lot of Rosie running through the crowd on the floor with security all around him. Like, throw shit at us now, motherfuckers. <laughs> and, and, and at the end of their show, people started yelling for them and going, yeah, you know. So they started off getting shit thrown at them to people just loving the crap out of them, right? You totally earned their respect. Yeah, and then, and then Aerosmith came out, and they were so shit-faced. It was, it was, it was ridiculous, dude. Like forgetting, it, forgetting the lyrics and stuff? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I was ready to leave. It, it sucked. That was the worst performance i ever seen Aerosmith have, man. After the greatest performance I ever saw ACDC do. And ACDC swore they had never come back to Fresno, and they didn't until, what, a few years ago? Before the other three retired? But if you yeah. were there in Fresno that night, you saw Bon Scott's <laughs> ass, and you saw ACDC say F you and kick ass, right? Oh, yeah. It, it was crazy. I mean, and, and Aerosmith, Falcon, they, 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 they were nothing. They were ridiculously out of it. Wow. Wow. Well, how... But this has been amazing going down memory lane with you. I'm, I'm going to cut it off now. And what we're going to do is we're going to have you back on another episode to continue the conversation, um, down the road, man. I want to have you back if that's okay. And just thank you so much for just sharing these rock and roll memories with us on rock stories with the Brumster at rock radio five, five, nine and at the Brumster Spotify channel. You totally rock hat. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for having me on, and uh, hope I, hopefully I can help you out, man. Anytime. Doodle. Awesome, brother. Hang on the line, brother. Thank you so much, Hat. Right. That guy right there, my mentor in rock and roll, Greg Hatley, the Hat. He will be back for another episode in the future of Rock Stories with the Brumster. We have just scratched the surface of this record. We have just just barely, barely got to the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other great rock and roll stories that he has to tell and uh, looking forward to hearing those on another episode in the future. And so glad that he was on today to take us back in the time machine. Rock Stories with the Brumster. That's real rock stories from the fans' perspective. Again, catch all Brumster stuff and Brumster productions over at the Brumster Spotify channel on demand. And rock stories with the Brumster every Sunday at 11 right here. Get the app at the Google Play Store. It's Rock Radio 559. Rock on. And thanks for rocking with me, the Brumster.